Okay, so this is our final video, and I just want to wrap up with a, a few things about T.S. Eliot. Some of my favorite lines from this poem come from the end. But before we get to them, I want to make sure that you understand something about symbolic landscape in T.S. Eliot. And then we can go back to those last couple of stanzas, the one where he eats a peach and rolls up his trouser and all those kinds of things. So if you look at the opening um, introduction to Love Song of Geoffrey Prufrock on page 2288 of our anthology, this is a moment where we finally discover that part of T.S. Eliot's genius is because of the Romantic tradition. And this is what it says, the symbolist influence on Eliot's imagery, his elegiac lamentation over loss and fragmentation, we just saw that, his interest in the evocative and the suggestive, um, da -da -da -da, uh, and recurring images show what would be called a romantic element in his poetry, but is combined with the dry, ironic elusiveness, a play of wit and satire, and a colloquial element which are not normally found in poets of the Romantic tradition. So this particular paragraph at the top of 2288 both displays how Eliot is a Romanticist, but on the other hand is not. And what makes him not part of that Romantic poetic tradition is his use of dry wit and irony and allusion. That next paragraph down that starts Eliot's real novelty, and I just read that to you earlier, I want you to go down a little bit further than that because we get a definition of symbolic landscape, and I want you to think about this. Prufrock presents a symbolic landscape where the meaning emerges from the mutual interaction of the images, and that meaning is enlarged by echoes, often ironic. It's interesting to call it landscape is echoing. Right, almost as if it's empty. So let's take that key phrase, symbolic landscape, which talk, talks about the mutual interaction of images that's enlarged by echoes that are often ironic, and let's go back over to the conclusion of the Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock on page 2292. He says, no, on line 111 or so, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, political, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. So some of you, if you've taken your Shakespeare class, you know that the fool is the one who speaks all of the truth in all of the Shakespeare plays. The next two line stanzas is very similar, um, but very melancholic, uh, very similar to women come and go speaking of Michelangelo. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. How could you not particularly smile at that summary type of idea? Shall I part my hair behind? Where's his hair? I thought he was going bald. But remember, we're non-linear. It's not him advancing in age and time. Um, time doesn't have a reference point here. Do I dare eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I've heard the mermaids singing, each to each. No, Prufrock is not going crazy here, and it's not that he's seen mermaids. He's using the symbol, the imagination of the mermaid. I do not think that they will sing to me. Oh, that's incredibly sad and melancholic, but he starts immediately again. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. Here we've started talking about the metaphor of the actual sea and the ocean, but then we start talking about the wind and parting of the water white and black almost as if it's hair and we've just had hair in the previous one right we've lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown they're not really mermaids till human voices wake us and we drown so this is the classic example of the irony and the juxtaposition human voices wake us do you mean that this whole thing has been a dream? That we haven't been able to really suss out where we are, who we are, and what in particular that we mean? We have a hopelessness through humanity, and then suddenly, when we awake to reality, 
we die? And that's modern humanity? Is it safer with the mermaids even though they won't sing to you? It seems like it. Even as a patient etherized upon a table, we didn't die. We came out of it, or we didn't, or that was an image. The one thing that we know is as this poem says, we drown at the end, but we're not sure. There's no closure. There's no conclusion. One of the things about reading T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound is that you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, with not knowing, and with asking yourself, what are the particular elements that go together? And let me remind you of what they were. He uses concrete images to suggest the abstract. There's lots of references and layering. All the allusions usually represent conflict. The representation of modern humanity is that it can't penetrate habit, custom, or cliche to get something substantial. There is evidence of rebellion in terms of gender and science being dissected. The poet is not a prophet, and it doesn't conclude. It's open-ended. And with that, this is what I want you to write about. This is going to be due, uh, what did I say? Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday at um, 10 a.m., 500 to 700 words, please. Uh, without the use of I, it's our regular formal O's, emailed directly to me. Choose one element about this poem and find a reference within the poem itself. And when I say one element of the things that I just read to you about the poetic form, the things I said to you at the beginning of the other video about what qualifies this is the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. This could be the symbolic imagery. This could be the juxtaposition of love song versus really elegiac stanzas, which is a juxtaposition. The concrete images, the abstract, anything that you just heard me talking about in reference to the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I want you to find your own. And I want you to write 500 to 700 words telling me how that poetic element shows up in your particular couple of lines or maybe even a short stanza or even just one single line in this particular poem. Be sure to give me the line numbers when you start immediately on your piece of writing. What I want to know is what's the interaction of the language with this poetic element? What kind of meaning do you get from this particular poetic element in your lines from J. Alfred Prufrock? All right. What I'm asking you to do is really local, localize um, your writing. Don't write about all of J. Alfred Prufrock. I want you to write about one or two lines and one poetic element. Show me that you understand what that poetic element means and how you see it coming up. Don't regurgitate what I've simply told you. All I've done is taken you through some of the lines. Find the meaning on your own. I'm not ever looking for a regurgitation or summary of what I'm doing. If you have questions about it, you can certainly email me. I will have email access while I'm on the road and will try to get back to you as soon as possible when I do um, find a wireless or something uh, around the area. Uh, I will be available over Google Chat if, if, it's, if it's possible uh, since I'm in meetings in New York City. When I get back on Thursday, I want us to take what you've learned from J. Alfred Prufrock and Ezra Pound and Blast and the history of the late Victorians to the moderns as we start to talk about Clarissa Dalloway and war and nonlinear narratives and psychosis and madness and PTSD all written all over this particular novel. And we read this novel so that we can segue into another novel that sort of fills in the blanks right, later on in the semester. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, my um, Minnow says hello. He sits at my feet, and have a good weekend, and I will talk to you later.